on something that, uh, in some sense, it sounds complicated, but it's not. Uh, we're going to talk about what St. Paul and others have referred to as the mystery. What is the mystery? Um, the early church, the early Christian communities talked about the mystery, the mystery religion. They were people of the mystery. And what is that all about? What, what are we talking about when we talk about the mystery? I had someone, the reason I brought this topic up is I had someone who contacted me and was very distressed with confession. They want to know why do you have to go to confession? It doesn't make any sense to them. They said, why do I have to confess to a priest? Why can't I just say to God, I'm sorry? Or the one I offended, I'm sorry? And that's the end of it. Why does it have to, you know? And so I realized that they had no understanding of the mystery. They had no understanding of the church. Because everything we do, everything as believers, whether it is good or it is bad, affects all of us. We are all affected by what everyone does. When someone sins, everyone suffers. When someone does is, becomes holy, everyone is advanced in the movement of the faith. So the faith is the sharing of this mystery. What is the mystery? And that's what we need to understand. What is? What are we talking about when we say the mystery? So I'd like to give you some thought here tonight. Every human being, unless he's, you know, crushed and numbed out, at some point in his life, there's a natural desire for a type of religion. Not necessarily going to church, not necessarily having a defined thing, but there's a draw in every human being, a desire to understand some very deep things. Everyone says, there must be something in this world more than just subjective. Not just what I think, but there's got to be something greater than my ideas. There's got to be something greater than just what I see here. There's got to be something more than just subjective. Do you all understand what that means? Subjective is how you interpret, how you see things. Objective is something that doesn't change by what you do or don't do. It's something that is constant. So everyone looks for the objective. You know, you, if somebody says, well, tell me the truth, and you say, oh, well, the truth is whatever you want it to be, then there is no truth. What is love? Love is whatever we want it to be. Then there is no love. So that we believe in the objective. We also want something that's connected. We want something that has a bearing on what came before and will have a bearing on what's after. We just don't want everything to be now. What meaning is in now? You know how often people value things that somebody else has. They love things that come with a history, that have a connection. So it's natural for man to want connection. It's natural for man to want to see a continuity. That's part of who we are as human beings. And then there's the element that most of us, as people of faith, get to. We want to see the ability, the ability to rise above the now, to go beyond just the human condition. Not to leave it, but to be able to carry that to something greater. We all desire that. We all want more than it's just here. So this is a natural tendency in man. But we, as believers, have the great privilege that we have been given the mystery. We know what the mystery is. The mystery in its greatest expression is Jesus Christ. The mystery of what? The mystery of God. Jesus Christ was God who became man in order for us to understand who God is. The incarnation, God taking on the flesh. Because of this, we are able to see God because we see Christ. And he says, but if you want to see me, look at each other. This is how we are going to know God, is by loving each other. Seeing the flesh, but seeing beyond it. If we can't see beyond it, we don't see the person at all. We are more than this, but we are this. And this shows us what's more. We have God 
in the flesh, Jesus Christ. We are able to see God because we see Christ. We are able to see Christ because we see each other. And we see each other because we're able to see Christ. It goes together. I can't love you unless there's something I desire in you. But if I love Christ and know Christ, then I can love everyone because he's in everyone. And therefore, then I have total connection, total relationship, and total involvement of what God came to this earth for. That's the church. We talk about it and we say it's the mystical body of Christ. It is the church and all of its members, which we are, is Christ's body on this earth. And therefore, if you're sitting in this room and I walk over to you with a large knife and I whack off your small finger, you're saying, oh, it's just a small finger, it doesn't matter. You feel that, you will suffer, and your whole life will be altered because that finger's gone. Not completely, but you will have an altered lifestyle because of that. We are all connected, whether we know it or not, whether we want it or not. What you do matters to all of us. And what we do matters to you because we are connected in God. And this is what the church is about. The Eucharist is the means we have as Christians of experiencing God. It is in the Eucharist. So let's talk a little bit about what that's all about. The concrete reality of our faith is Jesus Christ. It's not ideas. Christians are not about a belief system. That's not who we are. We have a belief system, but we're not about a belief system. We are not about moral conduct. That's not who we are. We do have a moral conduct as Christians, but it comes from something else. We don't become Christians because of a moral code. We have a moral code because we are Christians. What does that mean? Who are we? And it is not just a spirituality or a way of wondering what we're going to do when we go to the next life or how do we connect. It's not, oh, I'm a spiritual person. You know, it's none of that nonsense. We have something greater than that. We have the mystery. The mystery is Jesus Christ. What is that mystery? It is God entering into man's life. We can see God because we can see Christ. We can see Christ because we're part of the church. When we're part of the church, we can see Christ in each other. So we're all part of the reality. We're all part of that mystery. This is what's so important. Why do we go to church on Sunday? We go to church on Sunday and receive the Holy Eucharist because that's who we are. We don't go to church to feel good. We get make sense. We do feel good. Huh? You come to my, my liturgy and you don't feel good. You get miserable after you come. But <laughs> we we go to liturgy on Sunday because it is the mystery. Because we enter into something unique. What is that unique thing that we enter into? Saint Paul, the great teacher of the early church, along with others, say that. The church is the revelation of the mystery. The church shows us Jesus Christ. The liturgy enables us to enter into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what happens. The acts, the deeds of God in our salvation is what the mystery is. What did God do to save man? That's the mystery. They have the acts of God, the deeds of God. What did God do? God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that his son died for us and rose from the dead. And because of his death and his resurrection, we are dead to sin. We have new life and we have eternal life. That all takes place because of what God did, the saving act of Jesus Christ. That's the mystery. He is the mystery, and that is the mystery. And we enter into the mystery in the Eucharist. When we receive the body and blood of Christ, when we worship God, come together as the believers 
We enter into that activity of the saving deeds of God. That's the mystery. It's not a belief system. It's not a spirituality. It's an entering into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now we have become one with him. We are part of the body of Christ. When I am failing, when you are failing, when you do not live the faith, when you don't live the faith, when you falter in the faith, you hold back. You hold back the vision for the world of who Christ is. And when you hold back the vision of Christ, you hold back God. And people cannot see. How in the world can we say, you live in wherever, and you live wherever, and you live wherever, and you're not my brother and sister. We are all baptized Christians. How can we kill one another? How can we hate one another? How can we identify ourselves? If I said to you, um, who are you? You should say, you should say, I'm the child of God. I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the body of Christ. That's who you are. Not, I'm an American, I'm an Englishman, I'm a Georgian, I'm a Russian, I'm a Ukrainian, I'm a... That's, that's nothing. We are beyond all of that. But we're not, is the problem. We're not. Because we haven't understood the mystery. We haven't understood that because we entered into these things, these deeds of God, this saving grace that brought man back into contact with God and makes it possible for us to have union with everyone and everything, be connected to all of creation, transcend all of the things of this earth, and be connected to everything on this earth, it's the mystery. It's the incarnation. This is what it's all about. This is why it's so vital that we pray. This is why it's so vital that we take Holy Communion, that we don't, you know, I was talking with somebody about an individual who told me, we look forward to August every year because in August, we take our vacation. The whole family gets together, we go for one month, and we just enjoy ourselves. We do nothing but have a wonderful time together. And I said, what about liturgy? We take a rest from that. I said, you take a rest from being who you are for a month. That's pretty good. And the problem wasn't they were trying to be you know, not caring. It's they didn't have any concept of what has taken place. They didn't have any concept of how we have been changed by our baptism. How we are not the same as everybody else. We are part of everything, but we're not the same. And so our purpose is union with God. Our goal in life is not money, it's not education, it's not success. Our goal is union with God, is eternal life. That's what we're all about. It's only beginning now. It's not that, oh, I'll take care of that when I die. You take care of it now. That's what it's about. I remember I had a, a rabid, you know, excited parent who came to me and said, I can't get my daughter to stop coming to church. And she's becoming a fanatic. She comes to church constantly. And she's always at church, she's always involved, in it, and she's becoming a nut, and I'm very worried about it. And she says that the church is her family. I says, it is. And she says, I am her mother. I am her flesh and blood. I said, flesh and blood will die. The spirit will never die. We don't always believe that. But when you become a baptized Christian, don't think about this. You have new life in God. You have new spirit. You love your mother and father. You love your brothers and sisters, but your mother and father become spiritually your brothers and sisters. Because we all have the same father. So the bond is in God, not in the flesh. Your parents will die. All of our parents do. We die. When we get to heaven, are you going to say, there's mom? not at all. There's no marriage in heaven. It doesn't exist in heaven. Marriage is to get you to heaven. It's not in heaven. That parents are here to guide you to God. When you get to God, you don't need your parents to guide you. They're now your brothers and sisters 
who love the same God and same Father as you do. So what is the bond? We've begun that transcendent bond right now. But those of us who can't go quite beyond that bond, it's all about now. It's all about things that are only here because we don't understand this. We don't understand we're part of God's reality as saving man. He came down so we could be part of all of this. So the church is the visible sign of the mystical body of Christ. You can't see the mystical body of Christ. You can't see God the Father, but you could see Jesus Christ. He was the mystery of the Father. He showed us the Father. The church shows us Jesus Christ. So these are the constant signs we see. This is the constant reality we have. So when we go into church, we're not walking into a building. We're walking into the presence of the living God. We're walking as people who have been called by Christ to be his family, to be his mystical body. So initially, this mystery, initially it was the incarnation. God becoming flesh, taking on flesh. We saw God in Jesus Christ. So what was unable to be seen, we can see and we can touch. Then we have the next, from initially then to centrally. What is it all about? It's about the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, Pascha. There we experience the saving grace of God. It all happens. And then consequentially at the end, it is the church. We live the incarnation. We live the resurrection in the church. That's who we are. That's what we are. This all pulls us together in the church. And then we become alive, and we have an understanding of some of this. Our faith, what we believe, is not about the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's not what we believe only. We believe in Jesus Christ, who is the image of the Father, who is the way to the Father. So we see God consequentially through church, Jesus Christ, to the Father. It's all connected. So we believe in his teachings, but it is he that we believe. And we don't just believe in the things he did, walking on the water, healing people, curing. We believe in that, but it took place. But what we believe is him. Because he shows us God. That's where the connection is. And then by these very acts that he did, he raised people from the dead. He rose from the dead. He healed people. He forgave our sins. He brought us life. By those very things, we receive salvation. We are saved in him. Nothing we do in him. When we enter into the life of Christ, we are saved. But we have to live it. It's not just... I believe. You know, you've got to be it. You've got to get in there and do it. That we are liberated from our sins because He, He, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the visible sign of God, the mystery of God, He conquered sin. He conquered death. And therefore, because we enter into His life, for us it's also conquered. And we have to keep at it, of course. And then the union with God is possible through Jesus Christ through the mystical body, through the church, we have that full communion with God. We have to participate in the saving mysteries of God. We do that in liturgy. When we come to the liturgy, it is beyond us what's happening. It's absolutely beyond our mind. But by coming obediently and prayerfully and receiving the body and blood of Christ in faith, we enter into the entire life and into the entire activity of our salvation by taking Christ into us. We become one with the entire church. We become one with every believer on earth. We become one with the saints and the angels in heaven, and we become one with God himself by taking Holy Communion. It's not just bread. It's not just wine. It is, you see the bread and the wine. But like when you saw Jesus Christ, some didn't see God. But he was. And the bread and the wine are Jesus Christ, his body and blood. So when we come with that realization, that faith, we are changed. How then does anything else have any meaning once we have that understanding? 
how can we ever not do what we've been given, the idea of living the faith? Christianity, if we want to call it the mystery, Christianity is the gospel of God, the good news, Jesus Christ, connection to God, involvement, life. The mystery is God's revelation to mankind. Jesus Christ is the visible sign of that mystery. And so if we understand that, then everything we do has consequences. Why confess to a priest? Well, let me tell you why. Everything I do has consequences for all of you, good and bad. And therefore, in order to reconcile myself with all of us and with God, I have to come before you and confess my faults, my sins, so that I recognize that what I did is connected to all of you, both good and bad. So when I confess to the priest, he represents all of you, and he represents Christ. He gives me God, Christ's blessing and forgiveness. He stands before me as my brother, hearing my sins for all. So it's connected. It's not like, oh, well, no, I, I said to God, I'm sorry, so that's enough. It's not enough. It is, but we have to also recognize we're part of that faith community. So if we believe this, which I hope we do, it has enormous consequences for our life. Where is your home? The church. Where is your life? Christ. Why are you here? We, we understand the human relationships. If I said to one of you, oh, I, I heard you just met this wonderful person in your life. She or he is the most wonderful person you ever met. And you say, oh, yeah, absolutely. And are you guys going to get married? Yeah, we love each other. What would be too much that you couldn't do? I, can't, I, I love them, but I can't do this. No. If you love somebody, there's nothing that is too much. Not You could live under very adverse circumstances. You could, whatever, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, there was a wonderful movie. Here we go with a movie. Very old movie. And if you uh, can get it, I advise you get it. It's a most charming movie. It starred uh, Sir Lawrence Olivier, or Lord Lawrence now, and uh, Catherine Hepburn. It was called Love Among the Ruins. Has anybody seen it? Love Among the Ruins. It is the most extraordinary film and uh, touching. Have you seen it? Oh, you've got to get it. It's just a wonderful film. But Catherine Hepburn marries a younger man, and she's very wealthy. And this guy's a real creep. And he wants the money. And so he's playing that he loves this old woman who's by herself. And she'd married, when she was young, a very rich man, so she became very wealthy. And she loved this man who's now a famous barrister, a famous lawyer. But he's old, like she is. And so she employs this lawyer to fight the case so she doesn't get taken by this young guy. And it, it, it's very intriguing. He says, I don't think she remembers me. Maybe she remembers me. And he always loved her. He never married. He wanted to marry her. And she tells him in the process, after the, he wins the case, of course, for her. And at the end, then she says, I loved you but I didn't want to be poor. And I was so afraid if I married you, I would be poor all my life. And so I didn't marry you. I married somebody who had money, but I've never forgotten you. I married for the wrong reason, and I was never happy. And you gotta get the, it's, a, it's nobody goes to bed uh, nobody gets undressed. Uh, there's no vulgarity. There's no nasty language. Everything is very beautiful. Um, but it's extraordinary. Um, 
when you see how two people uh, can cause such enormous pain to each other because they put themselves first, or how uh, you can run after what's false and let what is real go. And she ran after what she thought was going to make her life happy, and all of her life she was sad. And he stayed faithful to her, but it was always, he couldn't get someone else to take her place. And so it, it's a beautiful, but we oftentimes hear Christ call us. We hear in our heart, he calls you by name, he says, come over to me, come. And we say, not now, I can't do it, it's too much. I want something else. I'll, I'll have you too, but I want this. And then we don't get anything. And then later on we say, why? Why was I so stupid? Why? Part of it is because we don't recognize the mystery. Part of it is we don't celebrate within our lives the greatest reality of all. That we are loved by God. That we are saved by God. We are freed by God. We find our identity, our purpose, and our future all in God, in the church, in the mystical body, through the mystery. So we are people of the mystery. And the mystery is God revealed to man. It's his deeds he did to save us, sending his only son, his death, his resurrection, it, our participation, now the church. All these things are what God did for us so we can be with him. And we say, I don't have time to go to church on Sunday. It's like that poor woman who married the Bucks and didn't get love. You know, we're so stupid. We say, oh, I'd rather have the money. Are we nuts or what? Yes, we are. We're deceived by the world, we're crazy. Nothing is more important than what is important. And what is important is God. And what is important is our relationship to Him and to each other. That's the bomb for tonight. Now it's yours. So that part you said about the relationship with each other, that's the world of confession. There. Well, I mean, that, yeah, that's part of it. Be, that's being responsible to each other. Yes. Yeah. But the Lord tells us, you can't love me if you don't love each other. Don't tell me, he says, that you love me when you don't love each other. How many of us has not loved somebody? <laughs> How many of us have judged somebody? Said unkind things? Don't want to be around? Some, yeah. So we don't love the Lord. And who, who loses? We do. We lose. Can you imagine, I mean, I've said this before, but can you imagine if just 10 people here, just 10, that's all, not all of you, just 10 of you, at, from this moment on, decided the most important thing in your life was God was the church, was your salvation, was loving your brother. Can you imagine the force you would have in changing this world if you lived according to that? Whoa. It would be like a nuclear bomb in the middle of New York City. And I believe if we lived it, we wouldn't have enough churches to hold all the people who would want to come because they would experience what's real. But they only experience what? our brokenness, our religion. They experience our religion, not our experience of the mystical body, not our love for each other. I was, uh, this week, I was talking with someone I've known for 2,000 years, and uh, her sister is a Roman Catholic nun. And she's, her sister's now 80. And uh, she lives in a house with other sisters. You know, they're very modern now. They, they have their own work and all that stuff. And uh, she said her sister called her. She's 80 years old. And she said, do you think you could get by this week to the, the house? And this woman says, well, of course. Do you need something? She says, yeah, I do. She says, what do you need? She says, well, I'm low on food. And she said, what do you mean you're low on food? And she said, well, because she has a walker. 
That's why I'm not able to get to the store. So what about the other ones? Oh, this is where everyone's on vacation. This, All the younger ones went on vacation and didn't think, what about the oldest one? And who was going to take care of it? They just left. And she said, you know, I feel not left, but I feel abandoned. I feel like I really shouldn't be here. I should be somewhere else. That They all just took off. And when she told me that, I said, well, you know, do you need money or something? I'll send you money. She said, no, 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 I, I'm taking care of it. I just, she, I'm just shocked that she's been, in her life, she's been 60 years a sister, and they're not worried about it. They just took off and went somewhere else. And But we do that with each other. You know, on Sunday we say, oh, do you know somebody's having a hard time? Well, then what are we all doing here? Why aren't we with that person? Why are we saying, oh, do you know she's having a hard time or he's having a hard time? We all go... Oh, gee, that's too bad. We all go on and do what we're doing. It's because we still haven't gotten it yet. We still haven't connected yet. If any of you were a parent or a brother or a sister, you know, you don't have to be a parent, and either your brother or sister or your child had some contagious disease and was sick, you wouldn't lock them in their room and let them do it by themselves. You'd get help. And if they said to you, mommy or, you know, brother, sister, whatever, please help me, I'm going to faint, I'm sick, you go and not worry, am I going to get sick? You'd be there because you love them. And you wouldn't say, oh, first thing is, oh, I can't go there, I'm going to get sick. You would go. We see our brothers suffering, we say, oh, it's going to cost us too much. I don't want to get involved. Somebody else can take care of it. And that's how we deal with it. We have to believe. And it's not things, it's someone that we have to believe. If I'm touching you and touching you and helping you, I'm touching Christ and I'm touching who I am. If we don't believe that, then we do all the crazy things we do. And we do a lot of crazy things. So, you know, the Lord said he'd save the city for one, one just man. Maybe we get one believer and change the whole city. Just one. It'd be like a forest fire. You know, the scripture says, I believe, Lord, help my disbelief. That's us. We believe and we don't believe. We need more belief. We always fall back on what we want, what we do. <laughs> I remember, this is many years ago, uh, there was a wonderful uh, priest who was giving a talk. And he had come from Europe, and everybody was very anxious to hear him, and it was wonderful. And one of the, the brethren was getting very tired, and he was nodding off. He just couldn't manage all this. And so he said to me, do you think he'd mind if I asked to be excused and go to bed? And I was like, you got to be kidding. This guy's incredible. He wants to go to bed. you know. And I thought, but we do that to the Lord all the time. The Lord's here talking to us and we say, you know, I'm tired. I'm going to go to bed. Uh, and we buzz off because we don't have time. we got to get the time. we got to get... We've got understand this. We've got to enter into the mystery. That's all there is. Every one of us is going to die. Our children, our parents, everyone is going. If you don't have the spiritual connection, you'll have nothing. Nothing. Well, that's a bomb for Friday night, huh? What is it? There's both the second side of the story that you see on this. You're absolutely right, but this is you gotta experience that. It's really hard to, like you said, most of the people they understand like in the mind, but it's completely different thing when you experience that, when you feel it, and that feeling you only could recognize in the Holy Spirit. Only then you could like truly experience that and that. Uh, what you said about the love, love to God and uh, love to our closest one, 
you could only experience in a hollow spirit. Otherwise, you cannot understand. I mean, mindly, you could understand that, but you won't be able to do it because you need the hollow spirit to help you and guide you. And, uh, like, uh, the, the, one of the saints, the saying, gain the hollow spirit. That's what's uh, bringing you to that. Uh, but how do we do that? That's the, the way we do that. The gospel tells us simply is we have to die to ourselves. We have to kill this man that's killing us. That's what we have to do. We can't do it as we are corrupted. We can't do it as we are sinful. We have to stop sinning. We have to change our will and submit to God. We have to be obedient to God. All those things that are part of the bigger package. But that's the thing. It's how, do you, how do you like? What do you like? do to gain the Holy Spirit. This is the most important part. What do you do? Like, there's many different things and uh, everybody should understand what they do the best. I mean, some somebody uh, given a prayer, they could do through the prayer, communion, confession. There's many things, but everybody should find it in... Well, you have to, The Lord tells us very clearly that unless we die to ourselves, unless we are willing to lose our life in order to gain it. We're not going to make it. It doesn't matter what else we do. If we don't let go and and put our will in God's hands, it isn't going to happen. Now, we're called to share in the reality of Christ. But in order to do it, like if I said to you, we're going to go to Yellowstone National Park. Come on along. That's the invitation. You're welcome, to, but you've got to do a lot of things to get there. You can't just say, "Oh yeah," you got to get off that couch for one thing. You got to have the physical ability, the financial ability, the all these things. How am I going to get there? You can't walk. So, what are you going to do to change your life to get to Yellowstone Park? You have to change yourself to get there. But the invitation is there. And you say, "Well, I can't change or I won't change, so I can't have it." Uh-uh. You can and you should, but maybe you won't. So your part is to change so that you can say yes to what you're being invited to. Otherwise, it's not possible. Otherwise, we just sit on these benches and we say, uh, sounds good, but I can't do it. Uh, not me, not me. And then we die as we are without ever getting what we came here for. Yeah. If it's not worth dying for, it's not worth living for. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine somebody that you say you totally love and you aren't willing to die for them? Then you don't really love them. I mean, you're not going to go out and say, kill me. But if it has to be a choice between them and you, you would die for them. So if, they're, if you're not willing to take up the cross and die so that you can live, you don't really believe it. You're not going to get it. It isn't going to happen. It isn't going to drop down from the sky and go, and there you are, now you're you're an active Christian. No way. He gives the word. He gives the way. He gives the path. He tells you what you have to do. We've got to do it. If we don't do it, we don't get it. It's that simple. But you get the strength from the Holy Spirit to do it. You do, but you have to deny yourself. Put aside all your garbage and say no to all the junk that's killing you, starting with your own ideas, your own pride, your own will, your own, all that junk, your own weaknesses. Until you say no to them, they own you. Mm -hmm. Until you put your passions in chains, your passions put you in chains. Think about that. But I think he was some technique to To Google. Yes, take two aspirin and call me a little. Just say I love the minutes. No, you can't. No. But what you can do is you can struggle to be connected. You can struggle to slowly change and with God's grace things will happen quickly but 
Like, for example, let's say uh, you're a sugar addict. You love everything that's sweet. You like bread. You like all kinds of starches, pasta. You like rice. You like corn. You like uh, cakes and pies and pastries, everything that you shouldn't have. You're diabetic, but you love it. The only way, you can't say today, I'm never tasting, and maybe some can, I'm never having another thing like that again. But you have to start cutting back slowly and say frequently no, 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 until you see that you can't eat it. I knew a man that was diabetic and he never ate a thing that would be dangerous to him. I said, how can you do it? And he says, because I look at it, it's poison. It doesn't matter what it tastes like, it's poison and I will die if I eat it. So if I gave you your favorite whatever it is and I poured arsenic all over it, you wouldn't eat it because you know it has poison on it. Even though you know it tastes wonderful, you won't eat it because you don't want to die. And he looked at the food and said, that's death. That's how we have to look at sin. Uh-uh. It'll kill me. And then we try. So what you have to do is reset your value systems. Um, let's say your next door neighbor in your apartment building is a very difficult person and whenever you get with them you either argue or you gossip about somebody or but it's always a negative experience you're not going to change that person you can't tell them don't do that don't say this don't. you can't it's you has to change so what you have to do is be quiet because you don't have control to say something that, that is always good. You don't have the control to watch yourself so you don't say anything. First of all, someone who gossips doesn't want a thing to do with you if you don't have anything to say because they're bored with you. And a person who's going to be mean, if you don't respond, they're not mean anymore. So you have to learn, i got to be quiet because I'm going to kill myself or kill them, so I'm going to be quiet. That's the first step you take, is changing your way to respond. And don't worry what people say. You know, say, what are they going to think about me if I don't talk? They're going to think you finally got smart. They're going to think it's wonderful. So we have to be serious before we can change. You're diabetic. You're going to die unless you change. You're gaining weight. You're over it. You have to stop. It's not, what can I eat? i got to stop and reassess myself. Can I eat these sugars? Can I eat this? No, I can't. If I do it, I'm going to kill myself. So, can we be a Christian if we don't stop the things that are destroying our lives? Father, but in this example that you gave us, do you think as a Christian is enough to do what you told, just step away and be silent? Well, in some things you have to. I mean, if I can't control what I will say when you say something, if you come and say something that's going to get me upset and I'm going to say something back, then the only way I can do it is to shut up. Because I have no control once my mouth opens. So I keep it closed. That I know from my own experience. I, that's what I have to do. Uh, some people could manage it and, and you know curb theirs, but some can't. Uh, for example, uh, some people suffer terribly from lust, a carnal desire. They can't. So if they look at somebody, the fire starts. Okay. You can do a lot of things. Some of the fathers poke their eyes out so they wouldn't see anymore because they would rather be blind and pure than be impure and see. Because they didn't have the willpower to stop. But that stopped them. Right up there is St. John, the much suffering of the Kiev case, that little icon. He was a monk in Kiev, in the caves, and he suffered from self-abuse, masturbation for years. He couldn't stop. He was a monk, and he was praying and praying and praying, and he couldn't stop. And he wept and wept, and, and nothing would stop. Nothing. 
No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't. And so he asked them to bury him up to his armpits in the ground. Dig a hole, put him in it, and fill it up to here with dirt so he couldn't abuse himself. And he stayed there for two or three weeks and dig him out and put him in a clean hole. Kept doing that. And after two and a half years of doing that, living day and night in a hole, because he did not want to lose his purity, God gave him the life of an angel. He no longer had impure thoughts. <clears throat> How many of us are willing to do that? Because we want the goal so much. How many of us are willing to do anything to maintain the kingdom of God. We don't. It's too hard. We can't do it. And so we don't get it. Are we willing to go the length because we love more than we love ourselves? That's the key. How do we do it? We do it by loving God more than we love ourselves. How do you pick up a child full of vomit and diarrhea that stinks and wash it? Because you love the child more than you love yourself, and you love the child more than you love the sickness. And you are willing to clean that child that you wouldn't go near anything if you went, ah! But it's because someone you love, you can do it. I remember seeing, which shocked me, I was in the hospital and there was uh, a little kid that was vomiting and swallowing its own vomit, it was choking. And the mother went over and sucked the vomit out of the kid's mouth and saved his life. And I thought, oh, but she didn't think, oh, she thought my child is dying and I want him to live. She thought more of him than what it would do to her. And I thought, wow, do I have a long way to go. I said, oh, the poor kid's going to die. <laughs> Don't die, kid. <laughs> How do we do it? I'll give you the absolute answer. We love. We find it always, it's so difficult, and the real answer is, I don't love, therefore I can't do that. I only love me. If I love, there'd be no question. No question. It's because I don't love that I find it all so difficult. Is that right or no? I mean, isn't that why you don't do it? Or maybe you do it and I don't know about it. <laughs> I've been thinking the entire time you've been talking about this last maybe 10 minutes, it seems to me that, that the heart always knows the way. I always tell myself, think first, with the, if I'm in a predicament, think first with the heart, I don't know if I'm right. But it seems like a, a lot, of, oftentimes, all of us as humans will start to overthink in our heads, and then we will become clouded with what right. our real compass is saying. Is that in your I think, yeah, I mean, our heart isn't always right. Okay. But, but because we have corrupted it with our our selfishness and our sinfulness and it has been damaged. So we can't always know that. Not always. Yeah. But but if we respond to God, to love, we can do it. Everybody's getting ready. They want to roll. They want a book. She's got rock and roll. Mama's waiting. Right. <laughs> I wish she could rock and roll. <laughs> so, all right. So anybody needs to go, go. No problem. And then uh, anybody who wants to stay, Talk a little bit more, it's fine. Can we talk about the gospel? Something with yeah. Kind of yeah, let's see if anybody has anything on this topic first. And then we'll say hello to Papa. All right. Um, I think uh, I think one thing that maybe we need to be aware of is you know just like in any like self help program or people suffering from addiction of any sort. Like, you know, they always say, like, the first step is, like, you need to admit that you have a problem. And maybe a lot of us don't admit that we aren't loving. Maybe a lot of us think that, oh, yeah, well, I am loving. And 
maybe we just need to realize that, okay, well, am I doing everything properly? Am I loving completely? Like maybe in this instance, I am being loving, I am being caring, but am I always 100%? And maybe once we come to this realization that we're not, it'll be a lot easier for us to overcome it. And, you know, an important thing to always remember is that love is never about yourself. It's always about the other. So if I desire or I want or whatever, that's all good, but that's not love. When I am thinking about what I'm getting, focusing on me, the relationship is about what this person could do for me or I want from them, that's not love, that's love of me. So I have to recognize that's not love. Love has to be the desire for you is greater than the desire for me. The desire of your well-being is greater to me than my relationship with you. So it's hard for us to understand that because that's not how we see things. I'm attracted to you and I love you because I desire you, but it's all in the equation of what I'm getting out of it. Should be giving, right? Yeah, both. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm going to get, but it, we should be conscious of the fact that we need to love the other because the other is lovable. And when we do that, we're not selfish. When we do that, it's not a, we don't do crazy things. I don't do anything to hurt you, to harm you, when I love you. When I love me, I do all kinds of things that hurt you because I'm thinking of me all the time. And so not you. So I'm thinking of me. It's not like, what's this going to do to you if I do this? It's, i got to do this. This is me. You know, and then... I let it fall where it may, and I say, but you know, I do love you. No, you don't. You love yourself. And you need to know that. Most people never learn to love. We desire, we care, we're, com we're attached to, we need, all that stuff, but we don't love. And because St. Paul says, tells us what love is. The first thing he says is love is gentle. We just had a big row. We're screaming and fighting with each other. We're cursing at each other. That sure isn't gentle. So that doesn't sound like love. Love is always kind, he says. Oh, we're not kind. Do you know what you did last week? You know, and we tell each other and we pick at each other and... Love never keeps a record of wrongs done. Oh, I've got a whole bookload of them, and I'll tell you about all the things you've done wrong. And love never seeks its own. I'm always seeking my own. And love lasts forever. This is over. I had that. That's it. Don't love you anymore. We don't know what it's about. We like people. We desire people. We want to be with people. We care about people, but we don't love. Let's get real about it. We don't love. Can you think, now come on, be honest. Can you think of anybody at one point in your life you thought you loved and you said you loved, but you don't even know where they are anymore? And you, you never love them. It's just yourself. Well, they did this and they did that. Love has nothing to do with what they do has to do with who they are. We don't love. Do you think, maybe, huh? <laughs> oh, he's leaving. You had enough of that. You had enough of that. <laughs> Goodbye. Well, I'm sending the house out fast. It's good. It's for us. That's it's right. It's for us. And, and all we do is is just sit for this pleasure all the time. And we think, and, and then we get upset when we, when we don't get it and we get unhappy. Do you ever see a kid when it has what it wants it, and you take it away? Ah! And you scream it and you give it back and it calms down. 
That's us. That, that's us all the time. But we think it's normal. I mean, we all know that it's, you know, mm -hmm. that that's the case. But, but the problem is that we think it's normal. That, that how, how many times I hit, do I hear that um, someone says, I just want to be happy. I just, I just want this happiness. How do I get this happiness? That's not about... Christ doesn't promise happiness. He promises the cross. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. And we have a cross around our neck, and we say, oh, how come I'm suffering? Well, for God's sake, you got a cross around your neck, and you bless yourself constantly with the cross and say, Lord, send me the cross. And when he sends you, you say, what's going on? Why am I suffering? Are we nuts? It's like going out and laying in the sun and getting burned and say, how come I got burned? The sun burns. That's what happens when you lay in the sun. If you don't want to get burned, don't go out in the sun. If you don't want the cross, don't make the sign of the cross. Don't get baptized. Don't wear a cross. He promises the cross in order to have life. And we say, but it's supposed to be happy. We're supposed to be happy all the time. I want to be happy. You know, we like Hollywood movies too much. It's terrible. Hollywood ruined the whole world. Everybody's waiting for the golden coach to come and take us away. It doesn't come. But joyful, maybe not not uh, yeah, not like oh, I mean, yeah, no, 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 yeah. Joyful. yeah, joy is from the Holy Spirit. That's not something we get ourselves. That, the Holy Spirit gives that out of. It's one of the gifts. Yes. Yeah. I I knew um, a priest who I've never known anybody suffered so physically, and he never ever complained. And when you went to see him, he says, "How are you? It's so good to see. You. How are you feeling?" And I'm thinking, I'm coming here to see you're dying, and he's asking me how I am and how everything is. You know, and every time you go, they they remove another part of his leg or part of his jaw. He had cancer everywhere, and he had, Every time you see him, he'd have another piece missing. And he was joyous all the time because nothing inside changed. The heart was clean, and he was loving people. And uh, I, I've never known anybody like that that was, you know, so like this person you're talking about. So you walked in the pre and you weren't sad. You felt very joyous because this person was so full of God and life. It was wonderful to be in his presence, even though he was dying, and you could see it, but his soul was not dying. But, but if he was suffering, then he said it is his goal to be joyous, he probably would never achieve that. Never. That's, that's the thing, that, that uh, for most of people, the goal is to be that happy, whether through church or through family or through anything else. The goal is wrong. The goal is to be... Loving, Love. to be with, to be with God, to be with each other. Yeah. yeah. It, the the results of loving is you are loved. The result of caring for people is you're cared for. Uh, the result of living a spiritual life is you're filled with the Holy Spirit. So everything changes when you change. The focus is me. It's not. You ever seen, there was a woman I knew, her name was Charlotte. And Charlotte loved to go to dinners and parties and gatherings. But then she'd go and sit in a chair by herself like this. And people would say, what's wrong? Nothing. I, didn't, I just want to be alone. I said, if you want to be alone, go home. We're at a dinner and there are all kinds of people here. What are you doing sitting in the middle of the room saying you want to be alone? She wanted all the attention on herself. She wanted that whole room to be focused on her. And... Of course, no one wants to be focused on you. Everybody is, you know, wants to be, heck with you, go sit in the car and cry if you want, that's fine, you know. But she didn't get what she was looking for because no one was going to invest in that nonsense. She had to give and she would have been part of everything. Life is about caring for others, not about caring for ourselves. Father, but sometimes when, when we talk about the kids, for example, we put, probably we mix the love with the passion or something else, that we spoil our kids with too much love. If, if this not can too be much done. love. No, it's, it's not, not I don't know where it's, it's the line, but yeah. it's we don't do it for ourselves. Sure we do. Sure we do. You wouldn't do that for somebody else's kids. 
You didn't go down and find some poor kid on the street and give him everything you gave your kid, not at all. But you never. No, you did. Yeah, you did because kids, like your kids. you see in your children part of yourself. You see that this is yours. You want to, you know, that's just a natural human response. But it's not always love. It, could you give your child what they need, not what they want? Or did you give in to give them what they wanted because you didn't want them to be upset or hurt or dislike you? Or We all do that. I think we get obsessed with... Like, there is some line that we are crossing, which we are crossing, between life, love and obsession yeah. for the kids. Yes. I don't know where this line Because is. we don't see the connection of the child to God, the child to all of us, and we're trying to bring them into this awareness of, of a greater life. We just see them as little entities that we love, and we see them as these little creatures that are turning into people. And we want to give them everything that they could possibly have. But it's not connected to anything but that. And you know what? After we give them everything, they're a pain in the butt and they do what they want and they hate you and they, they are not what you wanted them to be. Because you didn't give them what they needed. Kids don't need things, they need love. Kids don't need affection and attention. They need to understand how to live life. They need to understand they're connected to something greater. Um, but we don't know it ourselves, so how do we give it to them? We can't give what we don't have. You know, that's a problem. That's why we have the church. This is our family. This is where we learn to be who we are. Yeah, we just gotta understand it doesn't happen overnight. The love no. you're talking about this the Christ love. This is Well it can happen overnight. It's a long process and we yeah. uh, we gotta work, we gotta put the effort and yeah. uh, Whatever it takes. There you go. You see, it, it's a long process, but you've got to do whatever it takes. It doesn't mean, oh, it's going to be hard, therefore I don't have to do anything. You, you have to do something. A lot of you got to die. You gotta, That's serious. you got to die in you. Yes, you got to. That's it. Does that help not to be too much attached to the present to the future? There, okay, you got to think of this. you got to think of this. Nothing that happened one minute ago can you do anything about. It's done. You can't change any of it. You can change yourself now, but you can't change anything that happened. And you can't do anything about tomorrow because you don't have tomorrow. You only have now. Yeah, of course. But you can't spend your life regretting. You've got to do something about now. Now is when you can do it. Somebody says, oh, I'm going to tomorrow. No, there is no tomorrow. You're not going to change tomorrow. You're going to change now or you're never going to change. You're going to do it now or you're never going to do it. I'm not going to stop eating all these things that are killing me tomorrow. I'm just going to eat tonight. No, tomorrow's never going to happen. i got to do it now. Now is the time. That's what we have to do. Now. We have to start living in the now. It's a choice. It's a choice, but it's it's also a change the frame of mind. You have to stop living in past and future and ignoring the now. And we do that all the time. I'm going to change tomorrow. I'm going to do this. No, I'm not. I got to do it now. All right, everybody. Friday night. The club the club is closing soon. Question. <laughs> Yes. As you said, I'm sorry, I couldn't see. To put ourselves in the last place. I'm sorry. To put ourselves in the last place, what you're saying it will help us to see in you, in you, uh -huh. any any of you is a Christ. If you're doing good or bad things, you're doing it to the Christ. Right. That will help us change. To change. But you see, it's hard for us to think of being in the last place. But the reality is, we are. We don't have to think about it. We are. In every relationship, there are three people. There's God, there's the other, and there's you. You're not first ever. God is always first. And the other is always second, and you're third. So in every equation, you're at the bottom. But that doesn't mean you're nothing. It means you're part of all of that. And for somebody else, they're third, and so forth. Because God is always first, and loving the other is always second, and I'm always third. And so... 
all of my craziness is only one third of the equation. I've got two thirds working for me. So what am I worried about? And if we start seeing life like that, that I'm part of two thirds of, I'm only one third of that equation, two thirds or more and a carry, my life changes. When I think I'm first, woo. You never become second. You become second for somebody else, but never for yourself. You're always third. Oh, that's because they think they're first. And the fathers say that you try, and the help will come. Absolutely. Yeah. When you read the gospel, no matter how many years. years. That's right. No, it does come. But you see, love is its own reward. And loving yourself is its own punishment. Nothing is more debilitating and ugly than loving yourself. You are so alone. And when you get through with the charade and you go in a room and close the door, you weep because you're so alone. Because you know nobody can stand you because you can't stand yourself. But when you love... Everybody loves you. There's no reason not to love you when you love. Because people who don't love are nasty. We all know that. And sometimes we're very nasty. But when we love, nobody's nasty. They're wonderful when people love. Everybody wants to be around them. Okay. Yes. Let's hear you. Yeah, when <clears throat> you... You were reading through the gospel. Yes. And the Lord says there, did you see the, the small... A speck in your own eye? Yeah. And, and, but you don't see it... Uh, you don't see the, the big in your eye, but you see the small one in your brother. Yes. yes. And, and when do you read... And last time when you were reading the... The, um, the, 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 la letra de, de Pablo. Yes, the letter of St. Paul. Yes, the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Yes. No, Romans. Romans. Oh. And it says there that... Um, we have to remember that um, through Adam we we fell down. We inherited the sin. Yes. But through Christ we were saved. Yeah. And set free. Always when I when I when I hear those uh, pieces citations uh -huh. from the gospel, I, I, what I feel is that the the Lord is calling us to to gain back a normal. It, uh, yes. Balance. Yes. Because we, uh, you know, I, I studied psychology, and one of the most uh, common illnesses is uh, schizophrenia. Yes. And I thought. Well, we certainly had spiritual schizophrenia. Exactly. This is what I did. I I thought many times why so many people has this problem. And then I understood that everybody is a schizophrenic. Spiritually, yes. Yes. But let me put one example. For example, if a person never saw his father, and suddenly he received. And news that his father is dead, uh -huh. died, and left him like five million dollars. Oh yeah. This, this person will run there, and based on the fact that he's his son, he will ask for this money. Yes. And he will be convinced that this money is his. To him That's because right. He's his, but he, if his father doesn't leave money, but debts, uh, he will die. Have nothing to. That's right. I don't know who he is. Yeah. I don't know with this man. And this, this is this is always, this is the the general situation, and, and this this balance, psychological and spiritual, this balance we live because we are concentrated in ourselves. We are. That's it. It it comes to the point. I I notice that the people cannot bear other people's bad smells, but they don't notice their. Oh, that's it's, right. It's even not the. Physical, but you know, it's, it's even not the physical level. Yeah. It's everything. It's everywhere. Can't tolerate. Yeah. You you don't tolerate nothing bad from others, but uh, you can tolerate everything horrible from yourself, and you don't see. It. That's right. And but isn't you it, will not forget. And the the smallest flaw or fault of from another person, but you will not see. It. Yeah. It, isn't one of the characteristics of schizophrenia is the person lives within not out. Everything is inside. Everything's interpreted within the self. Yeah. That's the schizophrenic. They cannot they cannot 
relate to anything outside their own thinking, their own fantasies, their own delusions. In the Lord, in the gospel. And we do that spiritually. Yeah. We get locked into ourselves and can't see that we belong to everyone. On that note, how is everybody? I gave you all such cheery thoughts for the week. <laughs> Are we okay? Good. Okay. All right. Let, let us love one another, as the scriptures tell us. So that with one heart and one mind we may confess that I believe in God. That's what we say when we say our prayers. Let us love one another that with one mind and one heart we may confess, I believe in God, the Father of All together we believe because he's who we are. Those aren't just words. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the goodies, your time. Thank you, Father. All right, so... Uh...